there's a certain point where you you actually illustrate that with a an assumption or a I guess it's a question and then an assumption that it comes out of the question that many of your peers and then later students seemed like they had, which was that um, gender is performative, right? This is one of the, the feminist, feminist notions that, that comes out of, um, you'll have, you have to remind me of which writer this one was, but um, gender is a performance, right? And a lot of students immediately react to that and say, yeah, yeah, it's a performance because they know that there are culturally uh, contingent aspects of what we call gender expression, right? Um, but you, you actually point out that they are not understanding the depth of that claim. The real claim being made is that gender is only a performance, that there actually is nothing um, concrete at the bottom of it. You could just, it, it's all just a social construct. And this was sort of the golden thread that it doesn't seem like you ever questioned and that eventually led you out of this secular feminist mindset, which is that women are real. They're not socially constructed beings from the, the clay of generic um, gender neutral humanity. Like women actually do exist as real beings that are differentiated from men. And I, I guess on some level you, and it's, it turns out quite a few other feminists who we now call TERFs assume that that was the case, right? That there really are women. And the reason we should uh, be feminist is because we want to uh, uphold the dignity of these real beings who actually exist. Uh, but feminism on the whole in the mainstream has radically turned against that. The idea that that women are real. Talk to us about that because it sounds counterintuitive, right? It's like feminism means standing up for women, but we don't know what a woman is, and that's at the center of the question we <clears throat> open with. What's up with that? Right. So that's the central irony <clears throat> of feminism is that it's it's ostensibly a movement meant to defend women, but it's also very reluctant to say with any clarity what a woman is, mm. um, and that that has really I think that's always been a problem that's plagued feminist thought. I think it becomes more pronounced in second wave feminism, but feminism has always been very nom. It's very been a very nominalist movement. So in terms of how to get out of that, uh, not that we just talked about where, well, we can't talk about women as a universal category, mm -hmm. but yet we're supposed to be defending women writ large. Okay. Well, how do we get out of that? We, we make a nominalist claim that, the word woman is a, it names a category of people that because of that naming, because of that categorization is real enough to deserve a kind of political movement. Hmm. Um, but the reason I say this, this increases in the second wave is that um, I think the second wave feminist feminism onward was really influenced by Simone de Beauvoir and her book, the second sex, which came out in 1949. Um, she introduces the, the concept, I think, that gender would soon come to name, but she doesn't actually use the term gender in her book, right? The second sex. Um, and that concept is basically that one is not born, but rather becomes a woman. Hmm. So she's making a distinction there between being born a female human being, but then becoming a woman, which is this much more you know, socially formed identity. And so she talks about that social construction process of what womanhood has come to mean. And if you read The Second Sex, especially as a woman, it's pretty clear that Simone de Beauvoir doesn't really like being a woman very much. So she <laughs> writes about especially the bodily realities of femaleness in very negative terms. Hmm. And part of this is her existentialist framework. So she's coming from this atheistic existentialism where there is no inherent meaning in the world, and that the only meaning or the only purpose of human existence is to transcend our, the facts of our existence, basically, is to create ourselves, right? So existentialism reverses that essence precedes existence. Like who we mm -hmm. are is prior to our, you know, particular being in the world, right? There's this universal human nature prior to my particular existence. Um, but with existentialism, we get rid of the idea of human nature. There's only now the human condition. And so we, our purpose then is to transcend our existence and create this essence, create ourselves. And that's harder to do when you're female and you're more tied to the factual animality of being human, right? Hmm. You gestate, you lactate, you do these like really gradual, very bodily things as a woman. That's kind of a drag, you know, right. if all you, if, if your whole purpose in the world is these creative projects, um, 
that you're supposed to find meaning from. Um, so right from that point, I think, from, the, from really the beginning there with Simone de Beauvoir, I would say that feminism has, a, a mas ironically, a masculine bias because the ideal life is based on male physiology. And so Simone de Beauvoir's solution to the problems that women face is essentially, one, kind of a Marxist utopia, but also contraception and abortion. So basically, mm -hmm. women need to be f made free from their femaleness to be able to move and be in the world as much like men as possible. And I think that feminism since then has really, many streams of feminism have adopted that implicit masculine bias because our femaleness, especially female fertility, is this threat to success in the world. It's this threat to happiness. It's something that women should fear. It's something that should be tightly controlled. It's something that can undermine our autonomy and our empowerment, right? And so really that sets women at war with their own bodies. Um, so. Yeah. Physical realities are the things that anchor us to this concept of essence. So we, it, the, the classical philosophical tradition would say essence precedes uh, existence, right? So your existential reality uh, is lived in light of the type of thing you are because that's what your essence is. That's, that goes all the way back to the, you know, the ancient Greeks and Christ, the Christian tradition um, draws this in very, very consciously as part of our metaphysics and, and theology. Well, existentialism and then feminism sounds like by extension reverses, or at least much feminism reverses this and says that uh, existence precedes essence. So you exist, but it's up to you to decide exactly what type of thing you are. And this goes along with the idea of the, the blank slate, the idea that we're all just kind of a, um, we have no nature that determines things for us. We get to, to determine things on our nature. But there's an irony in that in order to, to hold that, as uh, Simone de Beauvoir does, it, you have to declare war against those physical realities that uh, so anchor you and constantly obnoxiously remind you about wh who and what you are. And this leads to, I guess, what, what's probably the most contentious part of your your argument or potentially difficult for a lot of people. And it is that the modern world and our the way we the way we view sexuality and the way we do sexuality actually reinforces um, this this concept of gender, this this disease concept of gender constantly. And so you point to the birth control and the abortion and say this is the result of these is that m women can act like men. Women can begin to become men. I guess out of this, the question that emerges is, fir first of all, you know, how do we prepare ourselves to grapple with the idea that the modern world may be deeply riddled with these false assumptions and that our own habits may have to change as a result of it? And then, um, you know, second, how do we, how did we get to the point where we're ignoring our own bodies? How, how is su such an obvious truth now something that we look at in bristle and we say, no, I shouldn't have to be captive to those physical realities. I, as a woman, should be able to live like a man, including, you know, have promiscuous sex without, <laughs> without getting pregnant. Yeah. I think what's happened, this kind of gender revolution is both conceptual and technological. And those things unfold simultaneously from the beginning. So you have these conceptual shifts happening at the time, like say Simone de Beauvoir is writing, and that's happening at the same time Margaret Sanger is um, is it, at, at work in her wildly successful birth control movement to popularize the, the social acceptance of birth control. And so, for example, in the 1950s, when the the technology for the hormonal contraceptive pill is being developed, that's the exact same technology that is used to manipulate hormones to create masculinization or feminization of the body. Mm. And so those that's the same technology create these things. And I think one piece of what's happened is that, you know, what it means to be a woman and what it means to be a man, that's grounded in generativity. That's grounded in how we participate in the transmission of human existence. That's the foundation of it. Whatever kind of social interpretations there are, which do vary and are sometimes historically contingent, that's the thing that doesn't change, right? That's how all of us got here, you know, even though we have technological help now, you know, the combination of sex cells is still what's at, mm. um, what's, what's at the, the genesis of every human being. 
There's no other, there's no other way. And that's incredibly profound if you just sit with it for a few minutes. But I think our culture has forgotten that foundation because we no longer function that way, right? I think our society becoming contraceptive has shifted our consciousness, our cultural imagination in ways that we don't quite realize. Mm. And it's shifted the meaning or the ground of manhood and womanhood to things that are apart from generativity and the body. So things like appearance, things mm. like external roles. So womanhood and manhood do seem like these boxes you can step into rather than this innate structure of your physiology that you can't change. So it's true. I don't, I think it's tempting to kind of maybe look askance at, at some of what's happening and say, whoa, what's wrong with those people? Or that's so crazy. But at the same time, it's part of a, a broader movement. It's, it's part of this gradual technological conquest of nature that touches all of us, right, um, in different ways. And, you know, you, I'm kind of looping back here, but you had mentioned the idea of gender as performance, and that's Judith mm. Butler, her idea. And, yeah, in the book I talk about how my students – really like that idea. Like they latch onto that, like, oh yeah, it is a performance, right? And I think that's because for, for young people and increasingly for all of us, like, everything is a performance now. Mm. Everything is a performance, right? Everything is being mediated through technology, often in very public ways. And so it's intu it seems intuitively true to young people that um, what I am is, is what is performed. But what I don't think they're realizing is that the hardcore gender theorists, at least Judith Butler, would say there is no gender that's being expressed at all, but it's the expression that creates this illusion, right? So that's the thing that I, I think. I think if people really realize that's what being that's what is being said, they would reject it because most people aren't hardcore anti-realists. Mm. Most people will, would kind of look askance at the idea that sex doesn't really exist. It's just mm. this social construct.